Jay Sano without intro music. Jay Sano with intro music. Intro music remix. Hello everybody and welcome back to Minecraft, coming to you on the Minecraft server. As always, jsano19 here. That's never how I start my intros, but I did today just because I felt like it. And we are still out in that cave where we last left off. I had looped around and actually made my way to the surface just so I knew where I was at. I had found another big chunk of this cave somewhere up here i lit part of it up and then abandoned it so we got to figure out where that's at i think it was over here in this big small room ah here we go it just led me to actually more ravine but ravine i had yet to explore and who knows what's up here this is where i went and threw torches down and then i believe i stopped we will soon find out. But today, I'm actually here to talk about perseverance. And perseverance in the sense of being stuck in the face of something that basically you're afraid of, but making sure you get your way through to the best of your ability. And when I say that, I don't want people to think that if you ever don't make your way through something, that that means you failed and don't have, quote unquote, perseverance. Oh, look, that leads right out to the entrance. And there's a creeper right there. That, that doesn't mean that you don't have perseverance. You're not going to succeed at everything you try to in your life. So I don't want anybody to ever sit here and think that, oh, Jay Sano is talking about perseverance and making sure you get through what you're dealing with right now. But more that you can get through a lot of things that you don't realize that you can. But yes, of course, sometimes things just are not going to work out in the best interest of yours. So I don't want people to think that if you fail at something, that it means you're, you're a failure. Because that is by absolutely no means true. So I don't want people to think that. But... There is a lot of things that people can do and that people have gotten through that they didn't think that they would. And that's more what this episode is about. Nothing specific um, talking other than my own personal experiences. I'm not talking about like, oh, this news story, this person, you know, happened to, to make it through blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. It has nothing to do with that. It was just I was thinking about it today. Actually, it's a random story on the way that this came up, and I will get to that later in this video. Um, but I've gone through a lot of different aspects and different sects of my life, I guess that you could say. <laughs> sex. No, not sex, but sects. S-E-C-T-S. -E um, I don't even know if that's the right term to use for it, but mainly saying different sects of my life as in Many different things that I've gone through. And one of the things that started me thinking about this earlier today was the fact that I was listening to the podcast, the Minecraft podcast, and they were discussing on there about bingo. And yeah, <laughs> bingo, how does that relate to anything? Like, that's a good question. I would ask myself the same thing. But about bingo and, you know, the, uh, the blackouts of the bingo card um, and things like that. And... I don't know if you guys know or not, because I haven't talked about this too much in my channel, but coincidentally enough, I actually worked at a bingo hall for four years of my life. And another thing brought up in the podcast was I worked at a Catholic church's bingo hall, which is very ironic because I am not a Catholic. I, uh, I'm, I'm more what you would call atheist i guess would be the term for that um yeah so it's it's my personal belief but i think i've talked about this before but for those of you who are new to my channel and don't know i have absolutely nothing against organized religion i don't see anything wrong with it i actually see it as a very great thing for a very great number of people uh people heed religion and take it as a 
a wonderful thing and they have a big community built around it and things like that. And I am no way I'm against religion by any stretch of the imagination. I just personally am not religious. So I hope that doesn't make you guys think different of me. But, you know, if it does, that's who I am. And I will not ever shy away from who I am. I used to be agnostic. I used to call myself agnostic. Borderline athe atheist is where I used to go with with my when people ask me what what are you religiously and i would say you know i'm agnostic borderline atheist and i kind of have turned to the to the thought process of being more atheist than agnostic not because of not because i'm a devil worshiper or anything like that but for those who know what you know atheism is it just means i don't believe in god i don't believe that there is a god um at least to the extent that you know many other people do but like i said that is my own personal belief. That's also, that's one of the cardinal sins of YouTube. I've talked about those before as well. Cardinal sins of YouTube is talking about your own religion. And I'm not talking about it in any way to get into a debate. Just letting you guys know exactly what my religious standpoint is. So, I mean, for for all it is, that, that that's what it is. So, you, you guys now know. So, that's the end of that story. But they were, yeah, coincidentally, I worked for this. Um, you know what I really want is a bucket of water before I continue on. But for all you guys, um, I'm sorry, that didn't make any sense. For what I was talking about before, this came up in the concept of the bingo hall. And the bingo hall is, like I said, someplace I worked for four years of my life, even as an, as an atheist uh, at a Catholic church. It didn't really matter because I'm not somebody who's like, I'm atheist, you're religious, blah, 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 you're wrong in every way. Like, that. Uh, of course, by no means is it that way. So I worked there. I got along with those people just great. A lot of people who go to bingo halls aren't, you know, go to work at bingo halls, et cetera, aren't religious anyway. So it's not necessarily like that they would be the ones judging, but that's a whole different story. But I was, I started thinking about the fact of, you know, the whole term blackout on the card. And I've never heard that term before myself, even working in that environment for, that was dumb, even working in that environment for so long, I've always called it a coverall. That's what we called the quote unquote blackout was a coverall. And uh, I mean, it's just different ways that people discuss things and people talk about things. And I'm getting way off topic here because what I was originally talking about was perseverance. But that was one of the things I did through college when I was going for my computer engineering undergraduate degree. I worked at the bingo hall on the side to make extra money because, you know, working in college, I, I didn't have too much money to spare and I needed to make sure I got extra money. So that's what I did to get my cash flow on the side. Yes, it was gas money, beer money, um, cigarette money. You know, it was all those things that you shouldn't be spending that type of money on, but that's what I spent the money on. So it it is what it is. But getting through my computer engineering classes, I quote unquote persevered through those because I wanted to get a job in computer engineering. While I was a co-op student for my college, my college had a co-op program is actually what it was. It was, you went to school for three months and you worked for three months and it was a way to help pay for tuition. It was a very expensive school in Michigan, though I have to use expensive in a very loose term now that I've lived out in the DC area and understand what college tuition actually can cost. It's, it's amazing how different it all is, but in Michigan, where I went to school, for a place that, for those of you who don't know, Kettering University, formerly GMI, uh, that's where I went, and it, it was not cheap for that area. So you made extra money to try to help pay for tuition, pay for your living expenses, things like that. And the way that they did it, as well as to gain work experience, was it was three months school, three months work. And it was great. I enjoyed the hell out of it. I got a lot of experience, real world experience, and came out of college with more than just a degree. I didn't just go to school for four years and then go into the workforce and be like, hey, I think I know what I'm doing because this is what they told me to do in classes, but I think I know what I'm doing because I've also been doing it for a couple years at, you know, one company, two companies, however many companies you end up working for throughout your your co-oping term. How did you hit me when you're not even there? Yeah, take that, zombie. 
Hey there, Arcus. Wait, was that Arcus? And Michael? I just realized that two people uh, had said hi at the same time. So, basically, I, I got through my computer engineering stage of life. Finally, successfully, four and a half years. Yes, it took me four and a half years. However, I will state that my college is traditionally a five-year college, and I got through it in four and a half years. So when I say four and a half years to some people, they're like, oh, it took you an extra semester to get through college. But when I say four and a half years to other Kettering graduates, they're like, oh, you did it in four and a half years. Like, nice. Because... I was very motivated to get done. We had a weird system actually at my college where you didn't pay per credit hour. You paid for either being part-time or being full-time. And if you were part-time, it was 12 credits or under. And no matter how many credits you took, less than 12 or 12 or under, it was one tuition fee. It was also one tuition fee for anywhere between 16 and 22 credits, I believe it was, but they tried to split most of the classes up into four credit classes. Hi, Enderman, that I almost looked at. And every semester, except my very last one, I always took 20 credits instead of 16 credits to ensure that I could graduate uh, on time, or early, I should say, uh, so I didn't have to be there for the, the full five years, and it worked out, it worked out well. It worked out well in the fact of graduation, but that's part of what I'm going to get into here. Hi, Creeper. And I finally got done with school. You're not after me. Why are you running around like a crazy man? These zombies are going to be the death of me. Like, literally, they are going to kill me. Which is what they're trying to do, I'm sure. I need to eat. You're going to get drowned away, I hope. Nope, you're going to come back. Oh, and you still hit me twice. Big jerk. Will he die? I don't know if I've ever seen an Enderman die to natural. He will now. Yeah. He still hit me once, and that was kind of scary, actually. Um. Um. What? That is a purple silverfish, and I'm not too pleased. I thought purple silverfish... Oh, you know what? They might come when you kill Enderman, actually. I was going to say, I thought they were only a new feature in the end, but yeah, they definitely might come when you kill Enderman. I'm going to fill this bucket with lava for the time being until I can get to a water source block. But either way, I finally graduated from computer engineering school, and... While I was a computer engineering student, one of the places I co-opt for, if for those who don't know, I don't know if I've talked about this that much actually, but I actually co-opt for the U.S. government, and I lived in the area that I live in now, not directly in D.C., but I lived just outside of D.C. in um, in Herndon and Reston, Virginia. If anybody is familiar, it's where I spent a lot of my my college time while I was a co-op student. But I actually worked for the Central Intelligence Agency uh, as a co-op student. And that was really cool because in the CIA, as a there's differences between co-op students and interns. And I was a co-op student. As Oh, I don't have any arrows. Oh, I dropped all the arrows off in that chest. Not thinking about that. That was dumb. Get you dead. I'm so glad we have regen because I don't have any potions on me either. Okay, you're dead. Let's hope there's not more of you. Uh, as an intern, you're what they call in the CIA lingo a gray badger. And I'm talking about not badger as in the animal, like badger, 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 badger. Watch that Flings video. Uh, but not one of those type of badgers, but a badger as in the badge that I wore to show who I am. My work badge. The thing that got me in and out of like doors and things like that. That type of badge. You're, they were color-coded, and you were either a gray badger, a green badger, or a blue badger. And if you were a gray badger, you were an intern. And as an intern, you only held, like, secret security clearance. Why were you, like, sniped out on the ceiling? You scary, scary mother of God. Um, as a gray badger, you were an intern. 
that was what gray badgers got and they only had secret security clearance uh they could only do basic things only go to certain areas etc if you were a green badger you were a a contractor so you were basically a full-fledged cie employee or cie cia employee but not really working for the cia you were contracted to the cia but you had all the same rights and and privileges that cia people did and obviously everybody didn't have access to everything but you had all the same rights and privileges as anybody of your level would have had in that you know particular job role anyway and then you had blue badgers which were official government cia employees holding top secret security clearance as a co-op student, you had to get the blue badge status. So you had to get top secret security clearance and you were treated as a full-fledged CIA employee. So as opposed to an intern, I was a, a co-op and basically was considered a full-fledged CIA employee. Um, so that's pretty cool to have on a resume and everything like that. But, you know, that's one of the things that I had done. One of the things that actually drew me to this area of Washington, D.C. that I currently am in is because I'd already lived here for a while. I already knew somewhat of the area. I knew I kind of liked what it had to offer and things like that. So when I graduated as computer engineering, I actually originally tried to come back and work for the CIA. Now, I talked to the people I used to work with. They were like, yes, we'd love to have you. They gave me a job offer. They said, here, sign this paperwork, go through the whole you know, process, rigmarole that you have to do, and welcome back. We'd love to have you. And I was like, great, that sounds awesome. And I just realized I left the wood all up there too, which was really, really stupid because I'm going to be really low on torches. So the problem is... In order to get the job at the CIA in the first place, I had to take polygraphs, medical exams, um, all all the stuff, all the things. I had to do all the things, and essentially I really did have to do all the things. So I get flown out while I'm a co-op student, or while I'm a uh, uh college student i get flown out to washington dc area for this whole three-day interview process day one is like interviews with people that you're going to be working with day two is your polygraph day day three is like your psychology exam day like there's just a lot to this whole process that you have to go through so i get to the stage of my interview where it is i don't know why you just blew up that was really weird I get to do day two of my process, which is the polygraph process. And I go through this thing and it can take what they say is anywhere between like one hour and three hours, depending on how things go. And I'm like, okay, I don't know, understand what that means. All I do is tell the truth. No big deal. This thing's going to be fine. So I go through my first polygraph. I get to some set of questions that they're like, oh, we're seeing sensitivity around this area. We're going to break this question set down further and try to figure out where that sensitivity is coming from. And I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't kill it. Don't kill my gold. And I'm like, okay, go ahead and uh, do that. This is kind of weird. And then they break down that one block of questions into more questions. And then they're like, oh, you're still having sensitivity around these certain areas. We're going to continue to break this down further. And then they just start to grill you. And I don't really mean grill you as in what you see on TV, but they just like basically keep asking you the same question over and over again. Polygraphs are actually set up in a, in a way, for those who don't know, uh, you will always answer yes or no to their questions. And you will always answer only the way that they want you to answer. If they ask you, is your name Jeff? You are going to say, well, it depends on who you are. Personally, I would say, yes, my name is Jeff. Actually, I would just say yes, because saying my name is Jeff at the end of that would actually screw up the test uh, in a way that they couldn't like grant me a clearance or anything like that. So they're going to ask you, is your name Jeff? I will say, yes, my name is Jeff. Then they will ask you, are you a college student? I will say, yes, I am a college student. They will then ask you, have you ever drank alcohol in your life? And no matter what your true answer is, essentially, you're going to end up saying no. 
as your truthful answer. And the way that they do that is because they want you to say no that and have that be the truth because not because they don't want you to ever drink alcohol in your life or ever have done drugs in your life or ever have committed a crime in your life. Wow. Better get out of here. But because they need to know how far you've actually gone. Because, I mean, how easy would it be for somebody who's addicted to heroin and does it every single day in their, you know, basement, garage, whatever, um, to say, have you ever done drugs in your life? And they say yes. And they're like, yeah, that's true. But it's we're, they're not keeping everybody out of the government who's ever done drugs in their life. I mean, they're, they're smarter than that. They just want to make sure that people are responsible don't still do illegal activities you know things like that you know everybody slips up when they're when they're younger when they're in their dire times they know that the government really is a little bit smarter than many people give them credit for okay good you're dead kill you i want you to give me some of that armor you got some good armor man um, so they're going to ask you the question, like, have you ever drank alcohol in your life? And my answer inevitably is going to be no, because what they're going to say is they're going to sit you down before the test is actually going on. And they're going to say, okay, these are the questions we're going to ask you. And they're not lying. They will straight out tell you all of the questions that they will ask you. There's no secrets to the, to the polygraph. It's, it's not nearly as barbaric of a means of anything as, you know, movies and stuff make it look like it's. They will tell you everything that's going on with the polygraph and they'll say, okay, tell me about all the times that you drank alcohol. And yes, I know that's saying a lot. Tell me about all the times, but you know, put it in perspective. It's, they'll say, you know, tell me about your drinking habits or whatnot. And you'll tell them all the things about when you drink and when you've drank and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end they will say, okay, so what the question on the polygraph is going to be is going to be is besides what we have discussed do you drink alcohol and it's to know to get a baseline if you are, are you lying to them are you holding things back from them so it's a good concept i will give them that the concept is sound problem is i continuously even as a co-op student had troubles surrounding the drug and crime questions like they would ask me have you ever committed a crime have you ever done drugs? And I would answer truthfully. I will straight up tell you I answer truthfully every single time I ever answer these questions. No. Besides what we have talked about, no, I have never done drugs. And at the time before I went to, uh, well, while I was in college, when I was going to get the, the job as a co-op student, I had never done drugs in my life. The only drugs I had ever done is somebody I think gave me a Vicodin and was like, hey, dude, try this. And I was like, okay. And I did. And I told them about that straight up too. And I was like, yeah, I took one of their Vicodins once. They they told me it was good stuff. They wanted me to, to have one. I took one. I realized the stupidity of that. I've never done it again. But I never smoked weed. I never did anything like that. I was a pretty straight-laced kid, except for the fact that I was a drinker. And I was in a fraternity house, and I told them, they asked the drug question, they didn't believe me on the drug question, they asked me the alcohol question, do you ever drink alcohol? And I was like, yes, of course I drink alcohol. And they're like, well, you know you're 19 years old, and that's illegal. And I said, yes, I, I understand that drinking alcohol is illegal, but you asked me if I do, and yes, the answer is yes. And they're like, okay. And they accepted that, as in it was like, not that it was okay that I did it, but I was being truthful with them, I was not lying to them about it. So the drug question and the crime question kept coming up as these major, like, points of, well, like, points of sensitivity, they kept calling them. So they kept coming back to the drugs and the crimes. And with the crimes, I, I think they were really hitting me up because at the time I was really bad. I illegally downloaded a lot of software. And I was very, I was very open with them about that, though. And I was really surprised that I ran out of torches. I'm not really surprised that I ran out of torches. I just ran out of torches. But I was really surprised that um, they even like gave me a second thought after, you know, I did some pretty you know, nasty illegal things back then. I downloaded everything I could get my hands on. I, I was under what I called the poor student or poor college student clause where it was allowed because I was poor. That's obviously not true. But anyways, they would keep coming back to the drug question as well. And I would get very frustrated because I kept saying, look, I haven't lied to you. I don't do drugs. I've never done drugs other than like that one time that I 
took somebody else's, uh, you know, Vicodin when they told me to take it because I would enjoy it and like whatever, like stupid. I was in high school at the time. Um, yes, I've taken Vicodin on my own because it's been prescribed to me and I still wasn't even actually a fan of Vicodin. It made me feel all weird. Not weird in a good way, but weird in like, uh, uh, I don't know what's going on way. I don't like this feeling type of deal. Hmm. I think I just got myself lost. But so it kept coming back to that. So after three and a half hours of talking to these people, and they just didn't believe me in anything that I was saying. I was told, okay, you failed this polygraph. Like there's, there's no question about it. You did not pass and come back tomorrow for another one. That's how unbelievable polygraphs are is that they give you a chance to come back the next day to take another one when you're out there for a job interview. I mean, they're not admissible in court. They're not admissible in court for a reason. It's because they're unreliable. They're actually trying to get them outlawed in uh, jobs and security clearance purposes now because they realized how unreliable they are. Because I told the truth. I was not lying to these people when I said things about you know, everything that I had done in my life and all that stuff. I was not lying to them and they still didn't believe that I wasn't lying to them. So they had me come back the next day for a polygraph. They give you two chances because they're that unreliable. Give you two chances. So I came back the second day. Same exact problem. Three and a half hour polygraph. I just felt like I was getting berated, yelled at, lectured, basically told I was a horribly bad person um, because of not doing drugs. And one of their excuses they kept using was, well, you're 19 and admit that you illegally drink. Why will you not admit that you've done drugs? And I'm like, what the hell is wrong with you? Like, I admit that I illegally drink because I do, and you're asking me a question. I don't admit that I illegally do drugs, which would be just as bad because I don't. Like, that is all there is to it. And they, I couldn't get that through to these people's head. I mean, but they were basing it on a machine. It wasn't their personal, like, thoughts and preferences. But um, So I was really frustrated and really mad at the end of these polygraphs. So I went home from these interviews. I just I just came up here knowing I didn't have a job, knowing I wasn't going to get hired because I wasn't going to pass their process and basically saying, F you to the government. I'm not working for you anymore. Uh, I don't even care. And continue to look for a co-op job. It was a little rough roads looking for a job. And about, ironically, about six months or so later, I got a phone call from my CIA recruiter who said, hey, they want to bring you back for a third polygraph. And I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, they uh, they feel like you deserve another chance at the polygraph. And I want to bring you back for another polygraph. And at this point, I didn't want to work for the government. I was like, screw them. If they're going to treat me like that, I really don't care. But you're going to give me a free trip to Washington, D.C.? I can't turn that down. I said, okay, sign me up. Fly me out. Give me this third polygraph and let's see how different this thing goes. So they fly me out there. I go to this polygraph with the thought process that I just don't care. Whatever. I'm never going to work for you anyway. Let's just go through this thing. So I, I take this polygraph and I will tell you, I breezed through it. I got done in 40 minutes maybe. The polygrapher goes... I don't know what you did wrong the last couple of times. He's like, and I'm not the official read on these things, but uh, yeah, you did just fine. I, I'm not sure what the problem was before. And I was like, really? So it's all, it's all about nerves. It's all, that's all it is. It's all about nerves. Like it has nothing to do with if you're really, li I can't say it has nothing to do with that. I'm sure that's a part of it, but for my problem, it had nothing to do with my nerves uh, or excuse me, nothing to do with that. I was actually lying. It was straight up just my nerves. I answered the same exact way three different times and passed one polygraph. All of a sudden, a week later, because I had passed the polygraphs, they gave me a job offer. And I was like, hell yeah, like this is crazy. I went from never ever wanting to work for the government again to I'm now going to work for the government like as a co-op student because like that's freaking awesome. How many 19 year olds can sit there and say I have top secret security clearance and I work for the CIA? Not many, especially not many in Michigan. So I felt like a I felt like a freaking baller, man. I was I was on top of the world and I worked there for a year and a half. It was fantastic. I can't say that the work was that exciting. It was relatively boring work, but the concept of what I was doing was awesome. So then 
I graduate from high school. From high school. Yes, I graduated from high school. No, I graduated from... This is where I just came from. Where did I come from, like, directly down here? I have no idea. I graduate from college, and I'm like, okay, I think I want to work for the CIA full-time. So I contacted the people that I worked with as a co-op. They gave me a job offer. They set up the whole process again. I'm like, okay, I got this in the bag. Obviously, I screwed up last time because I was thinking too hard or whatnot. Let's, uh, let's go for this again. So I get blown back out for the same three-day set of interviews. They go, okay. And when I say okay, I mean to the point where... The time before they had, whoa, oh god, oh god, die, 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 die. Oh, not me, die, not me, die, them die. Them die, not me. Chill in corner, regain health. Oh, uh, they go, they go okay to the point where I mean, do I have any arrows now? I didn't get any arrows from the skeletons, but I did pick up a bow. How random is that? Uh, okay to the point where. I know that I didn't do great on them because of it. The polygraphs took a long time and there was all these, these like issues, but I thought that I had passed it at the end, but they didn't give me the definitive you passed. Like basically the guy had uh, the last guy that I took it with as a co-op student. Um, but either way it was, let's wait for the polygraph results and all that stuff to come back. And then we will, uh, you know, I'll get my job offer and we'll move on from there. So a job offer is different than a co-op job offer. It means I will move permanently to the Washington, D.C. area. So I pretty much had all my loose ends tied up. Had everything going for me. Had my room packed because I was literally waiting for a start date. Um, I worked at McDonald's at the time because I was just in the limbo time frame between graduating college and going to work on my career and whatever that career uh, path was going to be, whatever company it was going to be for. I was literally just sitting there and waiting. All of a sudden, I'm at work one day. I work at McDonald's. My mother calls me. And she says, Jeff, you got a letter from the CIA. And having gone through this before and getting an acceptance letter and a job offer and things like that from them, I said, I'm at work, like on the phone at the, at the point, And I said, a letter? She goes, yeah. And I said, not an envelope, like a big manila envelope, but like a standard old letter. And she goes, yeah. And kind of says it like knowing what I'm getting at because... Like, it's realizing, you know, it's clicking into her. She knows I've been waiting for the, the letter from them because I'm just waiting to move. I'm all packed up and ready to go. And I said, can you open it up for me and tell me what it says? She goes, okay. And all of a sudden, there's just, you can hear on the phone, like, the, the ripping open of the letter. And all I hear my mother's voice, and I will never forget this day. And she goes, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. And I was like, okay, like my whole life at that point in my life was planned around the fact. I'm going to get some light in here <laughs> just by dumping some lava down was planned on the fact that I was moving to the area I currently live coincidentally, but for a whole different reason that we can actually make this kind of a series because there's so much stuff that happened in the interim. Um, my whole life was planned around moving to the Virginia area and working back for the CIA, the same place I had worked for before. I figured I was a shoe in I knew I had problems with my polygraph previously. I knew I had somewhat problems with my polygraph when I took it actually looking for the job. But actually getting that official letter that denied me, I, I, I didn't think that there was any way that I wasn't going to be working for the government. And I was so ready to go that I pretty much had what people refer to as all their eggs in one basket. You know, you want to make sure you split things up and don't have all your eggs in one basket because if, if shit goes wrong, then shit goes wrong and you got to know where to go from there. And 
I honestly, at that point in my life, had no plan for where to go from there because that was my plan. I knew Michigan was this very poor economy. I knew I wasn't going to be able to get a job very easily in the Michigan area. I had thought I had myself a job all lined up and ready to go, and I didn't know what to do. But here's the deal. What I was talking about here is perseverance. A lot of people think about perseverance as being something that means you, you succeeded, you got through, you finished. And in a way, yes, I did finish. I did end up coming out to a successful outcome. But you got to look at it. I graduated with a computer engineering degree. And all of a sudden, I'm talking to you guys about you know, my computer engineering degree and not getting a job when I was a computer engineer. And for what all of you guys know now is I'm a nurse and I'm a firefighter. Those have nothing to do with computer engineering. There's way more to what I did in my life with computer engineering than that. But I did persevere through. It just might not be in the way that many people think. I didn't get through because I finally succeeded and went back and started working for the government again. No, that's not how it went. But I did persevere through in my own ways. And this got brought up. The, I, you know, I I was going to talk about it. And I don't even remember exactly why the concept of perseverance itself came up. And uh, what I was thinking about with with everything going on. I need to like hide in here because it's still dark and dangerous. Um, I mean, part of it started with, oh, it started, it started with the bingo hall. Because, yeah, they were talking about bingo on the Minecraft podcast or the Minecraft podcast. And I, be, having worked at a bingo hall for four years of my life, I found it kind of like ironic to think back on that time. Like, wow, I worked at a bingo hall. How many people say that they worked at a bingo hall? And I was like, you know, how many people say they worked for the CIA? It's kind of weird. But the bingo hall aspect is so random and so weird that you you just wouldn't expect something like that. But I was also <laughs> just in my kitchen just to end this video with something kind of random, but it has to do with this. And it's, I was in my kitchen and I've been having kind of a rough time the last couple of weeks, just with like, not, not a rough time is in a bad way, but just like with work's been really busy. I've been out of town a lot. Um, not necessarily on things that I've been planning, you know, things for the, the lady things for, uh, you know, so some things for work, some things just for other people. Uh, so I haven't been in town a lot. I haven't had a lot of relaxation per se. And without a lot of relaxation, it gets a little like, ah. And this week I actually have like the house to myself, the girls out of town, the other roommate is out of town, uh, both for work. I actually have a couple days off of work. I have to go back over the week or uh, over the weekend, but it gives me basically the week off. So I sit there and I'm having the week off and I'm just kind of enjoying myself at the house. And I was making something in the kitchen and I was walking through the kitchen and I almost slipped onto my ass because there was one of those. I don't know if you guys have bags that you use on a regular basis when you go grocery shopping. Uh, I know in Michigan we really didn't, but in D.C. we do. But you bring your own bags for the most part or else you get charged to use their bags as well as the fact that it's more environmentally friendly, blah, blah, blah. No, I, I love the environment and I try to be environmentally friendly, but it was never something I had to deal with when I was in Michigan. It was, uh, you know, they supplied you bags, and that's all there was to it. You get charged for bags here in D.C., so you always bring your bags. So we have a bunch of these, like, reusable bags around. And one of them had fallen out of the closet on the floor, and I walked through, and I, like, slipped on it, and I almost I almost bit it. I came so close to biting it. And I was like, whoa. And I was like, you know what? Enjoy this moment. Like, granted, I didn't fall and kill myself, but, uh, you know, it was something that random that happened that, I almost hurt myself and I didn't, but enjoy the little things. And I just kept thinking back to that Scrubs episode where he was talking to the German guys that were in his in his uh, ICU that he couldn't understand. And he had this flashback to like when he was like dancing in the room with all the balloons falling, you know, and uh, I just started sitting there. I don't know why I started thinking of that. And I just, I just started kicking the bags around. And I was just like smiling and having a good old time and it, it just by myself in my house. And it was just because I was enjoying, enjoying the little time, enjoying the little things while I could. So I'm going to leave you guys with uh, a video of me doing the same. But anyways, stay tuned. I'll see you next time. And just remember, you're not always going to succeed at the exact thing that you set out for, but you're going to succeed at something. So perseverance is getting through 
those bad times while still keeping an open mind and celebrating the little things while you can. 99.